Okay, so our last two subjects in this chapter are reliability and validity. These are issues that are really super important to our research methods. Um, in psychology, we kind of struggle with some of these issues uh, because of the nature of the subject matter. So let's talk about this. You may have heard these terms before in other science classes or um, statistics. When we talk about reliability, the definition is the consistency of a measuring device. Okay. So I don't know if that definition helps you a ton. We want our, whatever our measurement is to be reliable. Basically we want it to be consistent for an individual or for, uh, across individuals. We want good, reliable measures. There are different types of reliability and this might help um, for me to introduce the types and then kind of talk about the definition a little bit more fully. So, there's test retest reliability where you administer the test to an individual and then wait some amount of time and then test them again. And if you have a reliable measure, you will end up with the same basic score both times. So for example, with IQ testing, we can give a person a test probably as young as 16. We could have, we could administer a test and then administer it any time in the future and they will score very close to the same score again because our IQ tests are highly reliable. They tend to produce the same score for an individual across like years of space between the tests. Now I want you to think about something like the big five inventory. You might have learned about that in introductory psychology or maybe personality theory. The big five inventory measures um, five basic personality traits just to remind you what they are. You've got conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, which is really a measure of moodiness, um, openness, and then extroversion. So if we want to know whether our measure, the big five inventory is reliable, we might administer the big five inventory to a person, let's say when they're 16, like I said with the IQ test, and then again when they're an adult, let's say when they're 40. If it's a reliable measure, they should score the same way both times. Except for that we know that people change in some of those personality traits across their lifespan. Uh, for example, people tend to increase in conscientiousness with age. They tend to increase in agreeableness with age. They oftentimes have a dip in their extroversion during their young adulthood phase. I mean, we have these sort of, you know, and neuroticism is a great example, how moody you are. You might score one way when you're feeling a particular degree of, of your moods and maybe score an entirely different way when you're feeling a different way with your moods, if you're a very moody person. So, um, oh, and we definitely know that openness to experience is highest among young adults and lowest as we get older, right? So is the test the problem? Is the test not reliable? Or is it that we're measuring something that's not very stable? So the fact that IQ scores tend to produce the same score every time, we can say it's a good consistent measuring device. And it's probably a stable trait that is very, you know, consistent across your lifespan. So in order to achieve test through test reliability, part of it is about the measuring device and part of it is about what you're measuring. Um, so we have to keep that part in mind. If we have, let's say, or test retest reliability, we have to look at, okay, well, what, what are we actually measuring? And is it something that um, we could expect a person to fluctuate on? And really maybe it's about the person and not about the test. So when we talk about test retest reliability, we're saying that we're expecting the same score for an individual every time we administer that test to them. And with a little asterisk saying, depending on what you're measuring. Inter-rater reliability. So here you see we've got three raters and they're all observing some kind of behavior. That's what the arrows are indicating. So they're observing some kind of a, uh, of a behavior and you'll notice that these three raters aren't agreeing. Rater one's giving it a good, rater two's giving it a fair, and rater three's giving it a poor. So this would be an example of poor inter-rater reliability where they are not agreeing with each other. In inter-rater reliability, what we would like to see is the same basic scores across all the raters. So if these three raters are watching the same behavior, 
and they're seeing it this differently from each other, we'd have to say that that behavior is pretty ambiguous and maybe we can't include it in whatever we're measuring because the raters aren't agreeing. Typically what we want is about 85% agreement across items and situations in a, a test. So we want iterator reliability to be about 85%. They don't have to agree on every single behavior, like how they're rating that behavior, but we want them to agree much more than they disagree. And we have to be really su suspect if the raters are seeing it completely differently. Like if we were to ask the rater, um, this is something I do in my my statistics and research methods class that I teach for graduate students. I have them watch a um, Wile E. Coyote cartoon and without us agreeing at all on what we mean by aggression, I just ask the participants, you know, the students to, you know, make a little tick mark every time they see an act of aggression as defined by themselves, like what, what they think is aggression. And on that first pass, when we haven't all agreed on what the definition of aggression is, you see people all over the board, you know, after watching a nine minute Wile E. Coyote cartoon, you'll have as few as, you know, one act of aggression all the way up to 29. And you're like, man, everybody is all over the page on this because people's definitions of what aggression is vary. And so one of the things we can do to boost inter-rater reliability is make sure that the raters are all on the same page, that they're all looking at the behaviors through the same definitional lens, same operational definition. So we watch another cartoon because yes, my graduate classes involve watching cartoons. Um, so we watch a second one and now we've all, we've gone through the definition of aggression. We all, you know, make our arguments about what should or shouldn't be included as an example of aggression. Now we all watch it and we end up with a number that's typically going to be something between five and eight um, examples of aggression in, you know, a same length, but different cartoon. Um, that kind of implies that we're getting improved inter-rater reliability by all agreeing on what the operational definition of the, of the behavior that we're studying really is. So we see this kind of design where you have raters looking at behaviors um, really commonly in developmental research. You'll have, you know, maybe a mom and a baby in the, um, in the laboratory. And then you'll have, you know, three viewers sitting on the other side of the two way mirror watching the behaviors, or maybe they watch the, the um, videotape of the behaviors. So they have no way of interfering with what's going on. Um, it's really common in developmental research. It's, um, it can also be really common to do inter reliability when we're studying like teaching techniques or other things where we're looking at a behavior. And um, it's maybe a behavior that could mean more than one thing, having raters look at it and say what they think it is. Um, there's a classic study where they were looking at um, lying, basically. And the assignment is for the participant to take the money out of a desk drawer. And then in for half the participants, they're told to lie and say that they didn't take the money. And for the other half of the participants, they're told to tell the truth. And they play the videos back without any sound, just the person's facial expressions are visible and the people, the raters do not know whether this is a person who's telling a lie or telling the truth. And um, so you'll have multiple raters watching the behaviors and rating whether they think this is a lie or a truth. And um, what you want to have is, you know, more consistency between the raters implies that this behavior was pretty obviously evidence of lying or truth telling less reliability, you're like, I don't know, this is an ambiguous behavior that probably doesn't help us. And so we wouldn't want to, we wouldn't want to include it in the overall data. So reliability can be measured a couple of different ways. The overall definition is still accurate, right? We're looking at consistency of a measuring device as in like a test in the test retest reliability or in the measuring device in the form of the observers who are um, reading the behaviors. Now, here's a clock. How many of you guys do what I like to do, which is trick myself into hurrying a little bit more by setting my clock incorrectly forward? I add some number of minutes to my clock so that I think, oh gosh, I better get a move on. Um, so every time I look at that clock, I know it's ahead. I try and do it sort of randomly so that I don't 
just make it into a math problem where I just, add, you know, subtract that number of minutes. I just sort of like twist the knob and go, okay, this is, t this is the time in this world. And it helps me to hurry, right? Every time I look at that clock, it gives me the same number, which is time plus X, right? X being however many minutes I put it ahead. It's very reliable. Every time it will give me that same number. Here's the question. Is it valid? Does it measure what it claims to measure? So a clock claims to measure time. Is my clock measuring time? Well, it's technically measuring time plus X. So while it is highly reliable, it is exactly reliable. Every single time I look at it, it gives me that same number, time plus X. But is it actually valid? And construct validity is, is the term we use when it's um, a valid measure of the construct, in this case, time. Um, the construct could be anything. It could be intelligence. It could be aggression. It could be whatever you're measuring. So construct validity is the test's ability to measure what it claims to measure. This is where we really get into trouble, let's be honest, because um, like with my clock, it is not validly measuring time. IQ test, hmm, very reliable. You will get the same score pretty much every time you take it. I keep saying pretty much because it depends, like if you took it when you were really young, you might experience more change um, as you age because um, they calculate the scores a little differently when you're young. Um, as you age, you might experience cognitive decline that is you know, biologically based. And so it's not really the test's fault. You know what I mean? So I say basically the same score across time. So it's highly reliable, but here's where we get into trouble. Is it valid? Are, are we actually measuring intelligence with our IQ tests? That's a really, you know, legitimate argument. Are we measuring what we're claiming to measure? Um, there's a whole debate in the field of personality theory about whether the personality scales that we use, like the big five inventory, are they actually measuring personality or are they measuring something else? Like different people have offered different things that might be being measured that aren't actually personality. And we run into a lot of trouble with our measurements in psychology because a lot of times we're interested in something that can't be directly observed, like intelligence, and we have to infer it from something else, like a test. And so we may be going from a construct that's unobservable to a concrete measure of something that's maybe adjacent to that construct, but is not actually what we're claiming to measure. So we get into a little bit of trouble in psychology for that, right? That we may not actually be measuring what we're claiming to measure in lots of different ways. The thing that we always have to remember in, in our scientific reasoning about you know, research and then our own designs, we can only claim to measure that which has been operationally defined. So when we say, for example, that we're doing a test of intelligence and we're going to define intelligence as, you know, the individual score on the Stanford Binet IQ test, we're really literally only talking about that part of intelligence that is represented by scores on the Stanford Binet IQ test. Like that's all we can talk about. We can't say anything else about other kinds of measures of intelligence or styles of intelligence or, or intelligent behavior. All we can talk about is that which has been operationally defined. By intelligence, I mean score on, on Stanford Binet IQ test. And that means I can't even try and extrapolate out to the Wechsler IQ test or the Woodcock Johnson IQ test. I can't even try and extrapolate out to that. I'm operationally defining intelligence as score on this test. That's it. That's what I mean by this construct. So that gets to that operationism issue, right? That while we may not know exactly what the construct is, while we might not be able to directly observe the construct, we can at least operationally define the, the part of the construct that we can empirically measure. And that's what we're validly trying to, to measure. So when I talk about using an IQ test to measure intelligence, I'm literally only talking about those parts of intelligence that are measured by this IQ test. And that's it. So in conclusion, all the way back from the beginning of the chapter, essential definitions are not necessary for science to move forward. We do not need to bog down and argue about what love really is. We don't need to do that. Instead, we can move forward with, with operational definitions follow operationism, right? I will operationally define 
love as for the purposes of this study. And we all get to operationally define it the way that we want. And someday in the future, hopefully, we'll start to see what the patterns are on this topic. And in fact, I say someday in the future, but there's um, literature reviews that'll come out every like 10 years on these co uh, these complex constructs. And you start to get a pattern um, of what's going on in the literature. So all we really need are those operational, operational definitions. We need to figure out a way to take this concept and turn it into something that is observable and measurable, right? And um, we really want to focus our attention on making sure that we're using valid measurements that are, are really measuring that aspect of the, on the, of the concept that we claim to be measuring. We don't necessarily have to always be as concerned with reliability because some of the things that we study in psychology are highly variable things that you would expect the person to score differently as they develop and they change. So we aren't probably as concerned about reliability, even though that's the easier one to establish to show that the person got the same score twice. That's really easy to establish or that the raters are seeing it the same way. Those are really easy to establish. Um, but what we really are worried about is actually measuring what we're claiming to measure. And that's the important thing. So validity is um, absolutely the most important factor in, um, you know, assessing the tools that we use in research. All right, well, that concludes chapter three. So I will see you guys back for chapter four.